Hello and welcome to the Automation and DevOps Summit. Today we're going to talk about getting more from your tooling and turning command line tools into commandlets using Crescendo. I'm Sean Wheeler. I'm the senior content developer in charge of documentation for PowerShell. And here with me today is Jim Truer. Hey there, I'm Jim. I'm a software engineer on the PowerShell team. I started out on the PowerShell team in 2002. So at the very beginning, I'm also the creator of Crescendo. Okay, Jim, thanks for joining me today. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what Crescendo is and um, why you created it? Well, Crescendo is a module that allows you to quickly wrap command line utilities, command line executables in a PowerShell module or PowerShell function. I created this because I know that not all commands are going to be PowerShell commands. They're going to be native commands, native executables, the ones that you run at the command line. And I still want to be able to run those, but I want to run them so they feel like they're part of PowerShell. They... So, um, so what does Crescendo, why do I need to use Crescendo? Uh, couldn't I just write my own module to wrap the commands how I want? Absolutely. In fact, uh, in the very earliest days of PowerShell, that's uh, what I wound up doing. I wrote dozens and dozens of scripts which wrapped individual executables. And uh, this uh, crescendo came out of a long period of wrapping uh, commands, and I thought about ways that I could generalize the approach. So that's when Crescendo was sort of born. After many, many years of wrapping command line executables, I wanted a way to make it easier so I could uh, write less code and uh, worry less about it. So Crescendo provides a um, generalized framework for creating commandlets, but um, are there other alternatives you looked at? Absolutely. Uh, one of the ways I approached this was historically, I would write a script, well, a script for one command. Uh, an alternative approach, of course, is to actually look at what the command does and re implement it in a couple of different ways. I could re implement it completely in C sharp and have it participate absolutely fully as other commandlets do, and turn it into a legitimate compiled commandlet. As well as that, you can take the script approach where instead of a function or a module, you just write a small script which allows you to take that functionality and, and wrap that functionality in a script. It means you're going to have to have um, multiple scripts or and a lot of common code which can be tiresome, can be, you know, um, boilerplate-y, if you will. I thought there might be a way to improve the experience, which is why what happened with Crescendo. So if we're trying to make uh, native commands easier to use, wouldn't um, tab completion do the job? You're absolutely right. Uh, we could have done uh, command completions for a lot of utilities. And in fact, we have a module that does that very thing. The reason I didn't choose that approach was because I wanted it to participate more fully in PowerShell's help environment. I can get in the middle of producing a, a command line, providing parameters and whatnot, and I can actually type the parameter and tab complete. The same would be able to do that, but I can also then get help in line with that and get prompting and provide type information for the value of the parameter. And so I thought it was a better experience. Also, I wanted to be able to have help produced so it participated in PowerShell's help environment. When you run uh, a command and you get help out of the native command line, you're getting a big blob of text, but I wanted to be able to have things like uh, extended per assistance for the parameter or examples or just 
uh, the syntax. And so I wanted to take, so I took this approach so I could do that more readily. Also, I suppose you get objects out of commandlets versus what you get from the native command. Absolutely. On the output side, there it's even more compelling because I can convert the text output of the command line utility into an object that I can then use with uh, where object or for each object or select object or any of our object filters. So it becomes even more powerful when I take the text and convert it into an object, which I support fully in, in Crescendo. Thanks for that explanation, Jim. These are the same kinds of questions I had when I was first getting started with Crescendo. I was looking for um, a topic to talk about at my local PowerShell users group, and I decided I would look into Crescendo. Um, so this is where I'm gonna switch screens and um, show you how I get started. And uh, we'll take a, a deeper look at how you put a Crescendo module together. Okay, so before we get into the demos, I'm gonna um, give you a little overview of what I'm gonna cover here. Um, and I call this my five steps to creating a module. This is the order that I did things in and that made most sense to me. Um, so let's get started. The first step was, you know, trying to figure out what Crescendo was all about by reading the blogs. The on the PowerShell team blog, there's a series of posts here uh, announcing each version of uh, Crescendo that's been released. At the time, um, Preview 3 was the newest version. So I started reading through these with uh, Preview 1. And if we go down here to the examples, this is really the meat of um, what you need to know about creating a PowerShell, uh, a, excuse me, a Crescendo module. Um, there's two things that you have to end up creating here. There's the configuration file, which is a JSON file that defines the commandlets that you want to create and the output handler, which is the code that you have to write to parse the output from the native command and turn things into objects. So this example here shows um, the minimal JSON that's required to define uh, a commandlet. And the parser code for the handler is right here in line in the JSON. Now, initially, this is part of what kind of scared me off from doing this because I didn't relish the thought of having to write PowerShell code as text strings inside of JSON. You don't get any IntelliSense help or any of that with, uh, with your PowerShell code. But luckily, in Preview 3, there's a couple of new features that were added. First was um, the ability to define multiple commandlets in a single configuration file. Previously, you had to create a separate JSON file for each. Uh, Crescendo still supports that, but um, now you can put them all in one. And the other thing was support for additional output handlers. So what we were seeing before is the inline handler and you also have the ability to do scripts or functions. And we'll see that when I get to that part of the demo. Uh, but this allows you to write your code in a PowerShell PS1 file um, and have the full PowerShell development experience that you're used to. The other thing uh, I want to point out is uh, I've since written a series of uh, blog posts about Crescendo on the PowerShell community blog. So uh, check them out. I, I go into detail on my whole journey uh, through this process and um, ex explain my decisions that I made um, trying to figure this out. So step two is choosing the native command that you want to wrap. Um, for me, uh, I chose the VSS admin tool from Windows because 
Um, it has a lot of subcommands and the help and the output uh, is very well structured. So it, it makes it easier to work with. And you wanna start with the help. So let's take a look at that. So here I am in um, the release version of PowerShell 7.2, and you'll notice I've got the Crescendo module loaded and VSS Admin loaded. This is, VSS Admin is the module that I created using Crescendo, um, and I'll demo some of the commandlets uh, that I've created here as we go along. But I started with uh, VSS Admin, help just to see what commands were available and then got help for each command and so from this help we can see the list providers um, is really simple there's no extra parameters but for list shadows there's multiple parameters here. It looks like uh, they're all optional, but there's two parameter sets because you can either use slash shadow ID or uh, slash set. So we'll see when we um, get into the configuration how you handle that. But the first thing I wanted to do was take a look at the output. So Let's see what we get from list shadows. We can see that the output here is, is fairly well formatted, very regularly formatted. There's this opening header text that I don't care about. Uh, and then each of these blocks of text is um, the information about each shadow copy set. And I can see that it's fairly well delimited. There's a, a colon that separates the label information from the values here. And, you know, I have a set ID and I have a creation time. I've got a shadow copy ID here, an original volume. And this is interesting. There's another colon here I have to worry about. And there's potentially two pieces of information about the original volume. There's the drive letter that it's mapped to, and then the volume path where it actually lives. So this gives me a good idea of what I'm looking at. And now let's get into um, actually parsing the code. So in step three, this is where I started working on the output parsers, uh, the code that parses the output from the, the native command uh, and turns it into objects. This is really the hardest part. Um, and Crescendo doesn't really do anything to help you with this. Um, you still have to do the work of parsing text into objects. <clears throat> what it does do is it allows you to separate the problem of parsing from all of the scaffolding for creating a commandlet and allows you to generalize that in the configuration. And we'll see that when we get to the configuration. So let's take a closer look at this code. So this parse shadow function is the function I created to uh, parse the output from the list shadows command. And what I did was I captured <clears throat> all of the, um, the help to a file so that I could refer back to it as I worked through each of these. And then I captured the output from each command into a file. So I had some data to work with. And in my script file here at the bottom, you can see um, I have code where I uh, call my parsing function uh, passing it to the contents of the data I've already captured. So this allowed me to kind of test this out without having to worry about uh, stringing the commands together and getting a, a fully one 
working module. So what I'm doing here is I've um, put a couple of breakpoints uh, and we'll step through the code and um, see how this looks. Let me start this. All right, so um, it's read the contents of the file and passed it to the parse shadow command. And we're in here. I've I split the contents um, into blocks of text, each of those uh, blocks of text. I'm starting with the um, at index one or the second block of text because I don't care about that first block, which is the header. And then I split that block of text into individual lines. So what we're looking for is what we saw here. The first thing I'm going to look for is this line that contains set ID. And so we'll step in here and we get the line. And you can see the contents of the line. This, that's that first line that contains set ID. So when I step into this switch, now we're going to parse that line. We're going to break it into chunks. And what I'm doing is I'm splitting that line at the colon. We saw that um, there was a colon there that made it easy. And uh, I'm getting back the GUID. And if we take a look here at dollar line, Dot split at the colon, and we get the second half of that. You'll see I've got the uh, uh, I've got the GUID there with curly braces and all, but I'm using this GUID type to typecast the results to a GUID object. And so uh, it's no longer a string. Uh, and then I'm collecting this data in a hash table. So um, I want to call it for my output object. I'm going to call this value set ID, and I'm going to assign the GUID to that. So this process repeats for every line, um, and it checks. Uh, it checks to see which string it's going to match. I'm going to remove this breakpoint and have it continue on down to my next breakpoint. And let's take a look at that original volume. If you remember from the output here, the original volume has two pieces of data. There's the drive letter and then the volume path. And I want to represent those separately as properties so what I'm doing here is I'm first, again, splitting the line um, at that volume colon location. So uh, back here, I'm splitting it based on that string. And so the second half of the string will be the remainder. Uh, and then I'm using regular expression with groupings to isolate the drive letter from the path. And I'm creating a new object here and assigning those values from the regular expression match. And then adding that to the hash table. So the process is the same for the rest of the lines. I'm going to remove this last breakpoint and we'll just let it run. And you can see the output here. Now I have my output as objects. And what it looks like in the finished product, if I do a get VSS shadow, You can see the objects, and I can filter that. 
with the select object. So now you know you've got real objects. So this brings me to step four. This is where I create the commandlet configuration. And at first I was um, a little nervous about having to, to write a whole bunch of JSON, not really knowing the schema. And, and like I said, I was more comfortable with writing the PowerShell code than dealing with JSON. That's why I started there. Um, but the JSON schema uh, definition at the top is your friend. It provides IntelliSense and Visual Studio Code and uh, tool tips that help you understand what you're getting into. So let's take a look at that. So let me go back to the top here. This is the configuration file that I created. And when I did this, I implemented all of the subcommands of uh, VSS admin, except for this first one, the delete shadows. So let's just get started, see what that experience looks like. I'm gonna add a new node here and um, let me switch to the problems view. And you'll notice that here in problems, it's telling us that uh, we're missing three properties here, verb, noun, and original name. So I already know where to start. I'm gonna define the verb. And notice we get um, IntelliSense there as we type. And my verb is going to be, since this is a delete operation, it'll be remove. And next I need a noun and the noun will be uh, storage. And now we need original command, original name. And this is where we're gonna put, I'm just gonna copy the same thing. This is where we defined the native command that's going to be run. So you can see how uh, this helps. And as, as you hover over each of these, there's a description that pops up that tells you what that uh, element is about. So let's look at a completed one in a little more detail. I'm gonna delete that. And I'm gonna skip get VSS provider because it's too simple, but let's get into this VSS shadow that we've been looking at. So the next element I have here is uh, original command elements. And you can see this is for the additional elements that have to be passed to the native command. Uh, and this is a, um, an array of strings. Uh, next, these next elements I have um, are descriptive elements. Uh, and a lot of this I just copied from the help text that I had captured and put in here. Um, this information, this is the information that ends up in the help for your commandlet. These get added as comment-based help to the module that gets created. So you can see I've got examples here, and there's even information about what the original command is that maps to this example. Um, and let's take a look at that. So I'm gonna do a help full on get VSS shadow. And you can see there's the synopsis text that we had right up here. And um, we've got all of our parameters described. And there's our examples. We'll come back to parameters and talk about that, but um, output handlers. The output handlers definition here is where we are mapping our functions, our parsing functions that we created um, in the previous step to the actual commandlet. 
So here I'm saying that this um, output handler is for the default parameter set. Uh, its type is a function and the function name is parse shadow. So over here in our code, there's the parse shadow function. Now, as we saw in the help for um, list volumes, uh, excuse me, list shadows, there were uh, multiple parameters. And the way you define these is um, you specify the original name. So this is the parameter as we saw it in the help. So slash four, and it wants a, uh, a volume spec there. And then slash shadow and slash set. Now the slash four parameter can be used in combination with either of the two others. So I'm gonna define three parameter sets here. I've got a default parameter set. Um, I've, you can search for shadow sets by shadow ID or by set ID. And so uh, now the name here specifies the name of the parameter for the PowerShell commandlet. So this is going to be the dash four uh, for our commandlet. Its type is a string, uh, and we've got a description here. Now, the um, as I started to work on this, uh, and I was testing these out, um, initially, this wasn't working for me. And you can see that the list shadows command, when you specify the four parameter, it wants four equal and then the volume specification altogether without spaces. So um, uh, at first this this wasn't working. And Jim, um, how can we figure out what's going wrong uh, as we're developing this? Well, there's a there's a couple of different ways. But first, I want to I want to make sure that we we focus on this gap and no gap issue. One of the reasons why it's present is because, as you can see in this particular case, the parameter is not separated from its value by a space. There's no spaces between the parameter and the equal sign and then the value of the parameter. So no gap tells Crescendo to, uh, to, to squeeze everything together and not separate things by, by spaces. We can actually see how, how Crescendo is putting the parameters together by using the function with the minus verbose uh, parameter. When you use minus verbose, one of the things that you'll be able to see is the arguments and the command line or the executable that you're going to use. So if you say uh, uh, get VSS shadow minus four or C with verbose flag, there's a couple of things you'll see. If we scroll back up to the top of the window there, you'll see that the first thing that's shown here is that we're looking at the command, the VSS admin.exe. And then you'll see following that are the arguments, each one of them separated uh, on, on its own line. And you'll notice that in this particular case, because no gap is set, four equals C uh, is, is present uh, as one token. If you were to have, uh, if you left out no gap or uh, had it be false, you would see four equals on one line and you would see a C colon, quoted C colon on another line and then uh, uh, that would not work because the VSS admin tool would see a missing argument and think that the C colon is a new argument, not part of uh, slash four equals. So no gap is there to satisfy this requirement in the command that parameters are not separated by a space, but separated by an equals for its value. And you can use minus verbose to see how Crescendo has constructed the command line. Yeah, that was really helpful as I was working this out. Um, I, I didn't even know the no gap existed when I ran into this. And I said, there's gotta be a way to, to get rid of that space. 
so I went searching the um, the JSON schema and found it. Um, and if I can interject here, if you sure. just hover over no gap, you'll see that I try to be pretty uh, explanatory about in the tooltip what it what it is. Yeah, so let's take a look at uh, a few others, um, a few other examples. I'm going to jump down to my um, resize commandlet and look at some parameters that I've defined there. And for example, the max size parameter, um, the, the, the resize command allows you to change the size of space allocated for your volume shadow copies. And the max size parameter sets the maximum amount of disk space that's going to use for these copies. And there's a minimum of 320 megabytes. So when you set max size, um, you can add additional um, PowerShell parameter attributes. In this case, I'm adding uh, parameter validation and I've got a script here that um, will validate that the value is greater than or equal to 320 megabytes. So that comes in real handy. Um, and then the other one that I wanted to point out was this platform attribute for a command. Um, and I saw that and I said, well, this command only works on Windows, so I better set this to Windows. And the valid values are Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. But when I created the module, uh, resulting module, I didn't really see what this did for me. Jim, can you tell me what's going on here? Sure, in this particular case, I'm doing a bit of feature proofing. Since we're still in previews, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to try to get in front of some of the features that I want to provide. One of the features I'm going to provide in a future uh, release is the ability to actually act on the platform. So if the platform is marked on Windows, if you try to load this module on another platform, it will not make this command available. This function will not be available. So this allows me <clears throat> to provide support for cross-platform because uh, PowerShell 7 is is cross-platform and I want to be able to support these functions on all of the platforms, but I also want you to be able to restrict uh, access to functionality that won't work on uh, the platform. So this, this key, this is not hooked up, it's not plumbed yet, but it's something that I'm uh, I'm in, going to be doing for, for a, a future preview or release. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right, so that brings us to the final step. So now we're at step five, where we can uh, we finished our configuration file. We've defined all of our commandlets, and we can create the module. Um, so let's jump into our console here and I'm going to start just clear my screen. And uh, as we saw, um, I have the module loaded already. It already exists, but let me delete the contents of the export directory, and I'm going to remove the module from my session so it doesn't exist. So now I'm going to run the command to um, export the crescendo module. And what this, what I'm telling it here is I'm giving it the configuration file that contains all of my commandlets that, that I defined, and where I want it to write the module and what name to write it under. So it's going to create this VSS admin PSM1 file. Oops, I ran into a problem here. Jim, what's going on? Well, when you have your configuration, uh, your output handlers in your configuration marked for function, 
Crescendo goes and ferrets around in your uh, environment looking for that function. If it can't find the function, it provides an error. And the reason it provides an error is because when you, when you provide a function name and mark the output handler as function, I actually take the function and inject it into the PSM1 file. So once you have created the PSM1 file, that function that you have somewhere else in your environment is follows uh, the module around that allows uh, you to not have to uh, ship another file. It allows you to uh, continually update your function if you want and re-export your module. But if it can't find the function, it has to uh, halt and say, I can't find this function, so I'm not going to export the module for you. All right. So I just commented out that one test line. Uh, all of my parser functions are in this VSS parsers PS1 file, and I'm going to dot source that into my session here. So now if we do uh, get command on parse star, you'll see there's all of my parsers. Um, so now I'm going to run that export command again. Oh. And now it says it already exists because it started to create a file. So let me run that with force. And now I have a module file. So I've been doing all this work in um, PowerShell 7.2. But if you're careful about how you write your parser code, this will run across um, any version of PowerShell. And to show you that, I'm going to switch over here to um, Windows PowerShell 5.1. And you can see I've um, uh, Crescendo is not loaded, and my VSS admin module is not loaded. So I'm going to go here and import module um, VSS admin. I should, I should uh, note that uh, it won't run on every version of PowerShell. It will only, uh, you, it requires version five or higher. So these modules will not run on PowerShell three uh, because I'm actually taking advantage of our uh, class uh, Syntax uh, that's available in five. Great point, Jim. Thanks for clarifying that. So just to show you, the module's loaded, and there are all my commandlets, and I can run um, get VSS shadow, and there's all of my output. So um, the, the important thing to note here is that um, as long as I didn't use any code in uh, my parser that won't run on PowerShell 5.1, uh, this will work on PowerShell 5.1. And the end user doesn't have to have the Crescendo module. They just need uh, files that Crescendo created. So that brings us to what's next. Um, we just released Preview 4, and Jim, tell us uh, what what's in store here. Well, Preview 4 included a whole bunch of uh, new functionality, which I'm pretty happy about. We have added a set of helper commandlets, which allow you to create crescendo configurations uh, w programmatically rather than through configuration. So there's a set of commands that allow you to create a new command, crescendo command, and, and help, and usage, and examples, and parameters. And you can actually stitch together uh, crescendo configurations with those helper commandlets, as well as creating uh, straight configuration. I've also created a set of help parsers. And the help parsers were an experiment that I wanted to undertake to see whether or not I could generate crescendo configurations based on the 
help that was associated with a particular command. Some of these complicated and rich commands uh, have uh, voluminous help and it's very, uh, very complete and describes commands and subcommands and parameters. So for tools like Docker and Kube Control and Fast CLI, uh, there are a number of commands, even uh, NetSH, uh, Winget, there are a number of these commands which you can use the help in much the way Sean showed in the demonstration to collect information about how the commands and subcommands work. So I've written a set of help parsers that provide produce configuration by running the command, getting the help, inspecting the help, and then generating a configuration from that. So I've delivered, I think, six of them. Uh, they're part of the experimental uh, directory in the module that we deliver. And they are accelerators, really. They, they aren't complete. Um, they don't totally solve all the problems. One of the problems they leave out completely are the output handlers, for example. But they do a pretty good job of taking all of the help that the command can generate and generate uh, crescendo configurations from it. For example, the Docker module has about 100 different uh, commands in it based on the help that comes out of the Docker executable. So these are for you to, uh, to inspect and depending on how people uh, take them and whether they think they're useful, whether or not we'll uh, spend more time and beef them up a little bit more and see how far we can take this sort of thing. Of course, there are certain things that uh, that are kind of impossible to uh, um, to generate from the help. There's a number of commands where the help is irregular or uh, it's not actually accurately reflecting the the behavior of the utility. And, and of course, you can't do much with that. But there's a number of commands, uh, uh, especially modern commands uh, and complicated commands where that is possible. So I've created these uh, help parsers to experiment and see how far we can, uh, can uh, take this, how far we can go with it to see. We've also improved quite a bit of documentation. The schema is now completely uh, documented, that is to say, it has descriptions for every element in the schema. And we continually work on the documentation that is part of our repository, and we'll continue to update that uh, as we get uh, closer and closer to our release, uh, which is targeted for early next year. Uh, we are, we've just released preview four, we may release uh, an RC. We haven't decided we will de make that determination based on feedback that we get, which means I would really like to hear from you. If Tell me how it's working for you. Tell me what you're, what troubles you're having. Sean? That, yeah, that is a great segue. So um, here's your call to action. Get started looking at Crescendo today. You can get Crescendo from the PowerShell gallery. Um, go to our GitHub um, and give us feedback there and check out the documentation. Just real quick, um, the GitHub site is in the uh, PowerShell org, PowerShell Crescendo. Um, and out here in the um, <clears throat> utilities modules, documentation. So if you click here on utilities modules, you'll get to this site and we have uh, full documentation now for all of the commandlets that were in um, preview four. And some more resources here for you. Um, this is the link to uh, the various blog posts, the announcements on the PowerShell team blog, my four part blog series on the community blog and uh, all the code that I was demonstrating today is available in my uh, personal GitHub repo uh, at this address. So take a look at all this and get started today and uh, create some crescendo based modules and publish them to the gallery. Uh, our, our hope is that the community will create these 
wrapper modules for um, popular command line utilities. So with that, I say thank you for um, viewing our session and have a good conference.